Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Ann, and I'm an alcoholic, and it's good to be in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd like to welcome all the new people here today that are here for the first jamboree, and, and they're here in the first year of sobriety. What an adventure. You're really in for an adventure here in Alcoholics Anonymous, believe me. I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me here and uh, for trying to get a hold of me every time they try to get a hold of me. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I thought my life was over and I was never going to be busy again. <laughs> and it's like my life is so full. I don't have, I'm very seldom home. I'm just gone a lot. And I also would like from the deep bottom of my heart to thank Cricket for the fantastic message she gave us last night. She said so many people died. What a walk. What a journey. And that's what Alcoholics Anonymous does. It tells us that we come from all walks of life and that we're people who normally would not mix. And we come together and we all have the last name, alcoholic. And what a family we have here. Yeah, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and I tell you how long I've been sober because one of my very, very favorite speakers in Alcoholics Anonymous who carried a tremendous message who I just adored. His name was Norm Alfie. And Norm is gone today, but if you ever get the opportunity to pick up his tape, please do because he's got a tremendous message for the newcomer in Alcoholics Anonymous. Norm, I always told you how long he was sober because he said with so many things changing in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, he said that you might get a pension plan going here. <laughs> And one day he wanted to get his full benefits. So just in case you get a pension plan going here, I want to get my full benefits. I, I got sober on June 16, 1968, uh, by the grace of God and Alcoholics Anonymous and, and very good sponsorship. But I had come to Alcoholics Anonymous previous to that. Uh, I had come uh, a year prior in 1997, and uh, 67, I mean, <laughs> I suffer from CRS. I, uh, I was 23 years of age when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I looked around Alcoholics Anonymous, and everybody was very old. I mean, they were old. They were 35 and older. And I just could not imagine life without drinking. I could not imagine life without drinking. And I didn't want to be an alcoholic. I didn't know what an alcoholic was, but I most certainly did not want to be one. I was told about Alcoholics Anonymous when I was 19 years of age. And I thought, no, I'm not an alcoholic. My idea of an alcoholic, uh, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous at that time, was an old guy that I knew on Anaheim Street, and Anaheim Street in California, Skid Row. And uh, Eddie used to wear a long brown black coat with a rope tied around it, and he wore his hair all slicked back. And he was always panhandling to get some money to get some wine. And I used to look at Eddie, and I think, that's an alcoholic. If I ever get like Eddie, I'll stop drinking. Yeah. <laughs> And that was my idea of an alcoholic. And when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I graduated. I left AA. I just could not imagine life without drinking. I could not. I didn't know anything about projection, but I immediately projected into being 40 years of age. I don't know why I picked 40. I'm 40 and some now. But I thought, 40, you're really old. You're really dead by 40, I tell you. And I thought, I just cannot sit in these hard chairs for the rest of my life. So I left AA. I drank for eight more months, and I'm truly, truly grateful for that eight months, because in that eight months, I lost everything. And I'm not talking about material things. I'm talking about everything inside of me. There was nothing left, and I didn't start out with a whole lot, but there was absolutely nothing left. Alcohol took it all. And when I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous, I weighed 85 pounds. I was malnutritious, and my liver was shot. And on the Sunday morning, you know, I've, I've had some physical problems. In the last two years, I was diagnosed with cancer uh, two years ago. My hair was supposed to grow back red, and darn it, look, it grew back gray. <laughs> and uh, I uh, had reoccurrence a year ago in January. So I can't tell you that it's been a hard two years. I can only tell you that it's been a learning two years. And I can also tell you that I feel that God has pruned me and pruned me back to the quick. And I really feel that... Uh, if it wasn't for Alcoholics Anonymous, I could not have walked through what I've had to walk through 
with what I've had to, with the dignity and with the courage that I've had to have to, in order to go through what I've had to go through is because of the people in Alcoholics Anonymous and because of having all of the time and doing and being there and participating and doing all the stuff that I do to work the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. But some years ago, if I had to know my liver was part of my immune system, I would have took better care of it. <laughs> some years ago, when I got insurance about 10 years ago, I'm a Kaiser member, and uh, I had the year I was going to give it up. I thought, shit, I'm paying them all this money. There's nothing wrong with me. Thank God. God has better, knows better than I do. But the first time I got a physical, Kaiser was very, very impressed with my liver. And, uh, you know, they never asked me if I was an alcoholic, and I'm not ashamed of being an alcoholic. You know, being an alcoholic, too. I never had a problem saying, I'm Ann, I'm an alcoholic, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, because it had kind of a nice ring to it. It was like being a doctor or something, you know, <laughs> compared to some of the names that I was called when I was out there drinking. And so I, they never asked me, and I didn't tell them. I was probably about 21 years sober at that time. And uh, I went in to get the results of that physical, and the doctor she looked at me and she gave me all the results, all the little things they'd taken, the blood work, and then she looked at me and she said, we're really concerned about your liver. And I said, oh, really? She said, yes. She said, this really only occurs in people who are hard drinkers or heavy drinkers. And I looked at her and I said, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got all excited and I said, no, I haven't had to drink, da, 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 da. And she looked at me dead right in the eye and she said, do you know that if you drink, you'll die? And I looked at her right back and I said, no shit. <laughs> piece of information to be given me. Yeah. If I know anything, anything today, I know as I stand up here before you this morning, my disease is progressing. If I know anything, I know that. And you may ask me, how do I know that? If you're new here in Alcoholics Anonymous, how I know that is I've had the opportunity to say, if you want to call it an opportunity, you just sit around Alcoholics Anonymous and watch some of your friends go back out. You just sit around here, and I'm not talking about people with two years or nine months or six months or a year. I'm talking people with lots of years of sobriety, lots of years. And it breaks my heart because something happens, and whatever it is, you know, Cricket said last night, and I always have to remember this, I've got to stay small in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've got to stay small. There's no big shots in AA. We're all just members, and the one that is in control here is God. That is who is in control of all of this for me. And I, one of my dearest, dearest friends, she had a tremendous message in Alcoholics Anonymous, and she hasn't made it back yet. And, you know, if they told me that I would die within a week, you know, I might do it, but I'm not guaranteed I'm going to die in a week. It's a very long, slow, slow suicide. And so, you see, I know that what I suffer from, I suffer from disease of alcoholism, and it progresses as I stand here. You know, when I was new in Alcoholics Anonymous, I used to say, why me? Where is it? Why didn't so-and-so get it? And those old-timers were just, were, oh, God, they were not kind, I'll tell you that. And they say, why not you, Annie? There's something about your face that pisses God off, so you stop asking God, you know? I mean, they had no kindness, no compassion, no understanding, no nothing. He was like, shut up, sit down, and, you know. And I, like cricket, I was, came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had an attitude problem. I walked around my first year of sobriety, and I gave everybody the finger. I cussed you up one side and down the other. From the first time I came in, when I came back, I tried to figure out how I could get out, you know. I wanted to get out here. I made a terrible mistake. I, I, my, I was too afraid to go out, and I kept waiting for them to tell me to leave. And they kept saying, keep coming back, you know. And then I found out, we're telling everybody in Alcoholics and I'll just keep coming back. I was so disappointed. I thought they just singled me out of the whole group. I, um, I came into a group in Huntington Beach. I went to a lot of meetings, but when I came into a group, I came into a group in Huntington Beach, and I am so grateful, and I love these people very, very much. And I, you know, I go to Jerry's. I cut hair today, and I, and I cut hair at my house because the people in Alcoholics Anonymous set it up so that while I was pulling up from doing chemo, I could get up and cut a head of hair because I am self-supporting through my own contributions today. And uh, I would do that. And I do some house calls to some of those people 
that are not able to get out anymore, like Jerry does get out, but he, I don't want him to come to my house. He's blind, and I don't want to fall into my house. And uh, Jerry and Gloria were very, very good to me, and I go to his house, and I cut his hair, and I spend a lot of time there, and Jerry played a very important part in my early sobriety. When I was about four months sober, he used to call me Crazy Annie. I had bright red hair, and I had a mouth like a truck driver. And uh, they'd say, here she comes, and they'd be taking bets on whether I was going to make it or not. And I didn't know this. I remember running up to Jerry when I was about four months sober. I remember saying to him, where are those steps? And how often do I have to run up and down them? You know? <laughs> I had visions of 12 stone steps that I had to run up and down every day. That was part of the, the recovery. You had to go up and down these stairs 12 times. And he kind of looked at me, real, you know, like, oh, my God, where did she come from? He said, Annie, he said, you go to a lot of meetings. And he said, you know, every meeting you go to, they read chapter 5. And he said, the how stands for honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. Now, I'm not going to tell you that I was honest, but I had willingness. And willingness is the key for me. And he said, and there's 12 steps there. He said, and they read them every meeting you go to, honey. And he said, I want to tell you. He said, if you uh, work the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous or apply the steps, to the best of your ability, he said, I guarantee you, your life will change. And if you're new here today, if you apply the steps to the best of your ability, I guarantee you, your life will change. It may not change the way you want it to change, but it will change, you know, because nothing ever comes to stay here in Alcoholics Anonymous. It always comes to pass. I got me a sponsor, and I love this woman very, very much. She became everything to me. And she was my sister, she was my mother, she was my best friend, and she was very, very gentle, and she was able to take me down when she needed to take me down, and she gave me directions, and she was the first person in my whole entire life that I can honestly say that loved me unconditionally, and it took me a long time to realize that with her. And that woman told me on a daily basis that I was a child of God and God loved me, and I drove this woman insane, totally insane, absolutely nuts. I would, you know, I was calling her every five minutes to the day. She had five children. She was a single parent. And, no, she was married to John at that time, and then John and her got divorced. But it was like all the time she, she raised me. I went to her house when I got sober. I didn't know how to read, and I didn't know how to write, and it's got nothing to do with my disease of alcoholism. It's got to do with where I came from, and, and my people were not interested in education, and it wasn't that very important. And uh, I was about 10 months sober. I decided that I wasn't going to do the fourth step, fourth and fifth step. And John, my sponsor's husband, came up to me at my home group, and he said, Annie, he said, have you done the fourth and fifth step? And I said, no, John, I'm not going to do it. I said, that's for those of you who drank for 15 or 20 years. You're much sicker than those of us when he drank for 11. <laughs> and he looked at me, and he said, you know what? He said, if you don't do the fourth and fifth step, he said, I'm going to announce it all over Huntington Beach for them not to listen to you, that you're not working the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, he put terror in my heart, absolutely terror. I went home that night. Now, I really relate with step two. Uh, I am really crazy. And I go home, and how I was going to solve this problem in order not to do it, I decided what I'd do was well, I would drown myself in the bathtub. That's how I do it. I would just get in the bathtub, fill it up with water, and I would slide down in the tub and dry myself. And I listened very, very carefully in the meetings of reading Chapter 5, and I could recite Chapter 5. They hated me. I would just, I still recite it. I'd never leave any commas, periods, or anything. It's just, I just say it like a poem. And uh, I remember them when they read Chapter 5, they'd say, and there are those who have grave emotional mental disorders. And I kind of stood back up, and I thought, uh-uh. Those guys are not going to go around AA and say, well, that's what happened to Annie. She had grave emotional and mental disorders. <laughs> that's why Annie commits suicide, you know. So I didn't, and I'm not big on suicide. I'm more apt to kill you than I am to kill myself. <laughs> and and any time I ever talk about suicide, it's usually I'm just going to jump off the curb because I don't like to hurt myself that much. <laughs> I ended up uh, the next day I went out and I got all this paper and pencils and and I didn't drive a car for the first four and a half years because I couldn't take that silly little test. And I got a ride, and I arrived over at my sponsor's house, and I sat down at our kitchen table, and, 
And if you're new here today, you're going to find that you're going to find a whole bunch of very narrow-minded people here in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I sat down and I hand her all this paper and pencils and she had all colors. And I, she said, what's this for, honey? And I said, well, I'm going to tell you all about it. You start writing. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, I'm going to write. And I said, yeah, I'll tell you. You just write it. That's what they want me to do. This is what we're going to do. And she said, honey, I've done my inventory and now you get to do yours. And the only emotion I knew when I came here, I was very angry, just rage. And anger for me is terror, absolute, total terror. And I left the house, and I got a ride home. When I went home, and I'd call her, and this was way before they had machines. And I would call her up on the phone, and all she would say was, right, 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 right. And I would hang up the phone. And I uh, was a great pacer. I loved to pace. I used to have a big book under my arm, and I'd walk back and forth, you know, and and I used to think it was going to go up through my arm and into my head, and I was going to get all this knowledge. This is how I was going to get all this stuff. And I couldn't tell her. I couldn't tell her. I had a lot of secrets, but I couldn't tell her that one. And so I told her, and she said, Annie, she said, I don't care how you do it, but you do it. And so I did. I made a lot of marks on our paper, and I did that inventory. And, and I am so, you know, in step six in the 12 and 12, it says that wishful thinking is a character defect. And to this day, I wished I kept that inventory because there's no comparison to the girl that took that inventory to the woman that stands before you tonight. I, um, I do know how to read and I do know how to write, and that came, again, through people in Alcoholics Anonymous. There was a little gal named Mary Jane who was in special education, and, and the gal that made the 12-step call on me happened to be a teacher, Carolyn C., and, and both of those got together, and, and Mary Jane's gone today, and she's just a wonderful, wonderful lady. And, and Mary Jane and Carolyn got together and they took me out to some psychiatrists out there in Orange and they tested me and, and they gave all kinds of tests and they said, they came up with, they said, I wasn't wired right. Well, God, I know all my life I wasn't wired right, you know. I didn't need a group of psychiatrists to tell me I wasn't wired right. And they said, I had a thing called dyslexia that I saw things backwards and I did, I saw things backwards and, and, the, and I even tell my story backwards sometimes. And uh, so they... My sponsor, I was five years sober, my sponsor took me to uh, another lady came into play there and another lady taught me my ABCs and taught me, she was a child psychiatrist, I thought that was very, very appropriate for somebody like me, and took me to school and I remember when she took me to this learning center, I remember standing outside, she filled out all the papers and got me ready just like I was five years old, I was kindergarten, and she stood at the door and I said, you come in with me please, and she said, no honey, I'll be here when you come out. And what I'm trying to tell you is that I have not had to do anything alone in the 29 and a half years driving sober in Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that what I want to share with you, what I found in that inventory, and I'm not going to give you details, folks, I used to, <laughs> is to say, let your hair down, and I did, and then they said, no, 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 not too long, Get it. don't do that any. I mean, I'd give you all the details, I don't do that anymore, I'll tell you in a general way what I learned in that inventory. And, and I've taken many, many inventories because I'm one of those, one of these people that believe, at least for me, I don't know about you, but for me, I believe that I have to continue to work the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't believe that the first, the last three steps are maintenance steps. I have to go back, and I've had to go back and rework those steps in the, into my life because the same, uh, same steps that worked for me last year most certainly will not work for me this year. And I tried to do an annual inventory, and I tried to do it right before my AA birthday so that I know where I'm at and what I need to be doing for the next year. And, you know, I've found I've got more defects of character now than I did when I walked through the doors. You know, I didn't know what a defect of character. I thought that was something you ate. I didn't know what that was when I got here. I um, go back to being very, very young, and I was born with tremendous, tremendous fears. And, and uh, I'm Irish and I'm Catholic. That gave me two strikes against me you know, right off the bat. And I'm not one of those Irish that's never seen the skies of Ireland. I lived there for 17 and a half years of my life. And I'm the eighth child out of 10. And we had a very, very small home. And my, I listened, and I was raised in the school of Alcoholics Anonymous. You do not label someone else an alcoholic. But I've listened to enough men here in Alcoholics Anonymous that I would say that my dad definitely had a problem with alcohol. My dad um, had a problem not just with alcohol. He had a problem with gambling, and he had a problem with women. And he had a lot of problems. And he brought it into the house. And my mother, the only thing she ever did was she had too many kids. And uh, she was absolutely, my mother was nuts. She was, just, was, she was married at 15 years of age, and she never grew up. And 
my mother died two years ago, and, and I want you to know that I love my parents very, very much. It took me a long time to get there because I was a blamer. I blamed everybody. I couldn't take responsibility for me. And through Alcoholics Anonymous, I take full responsibility for what I say and for my actions today. I am... Um, but I couldn't at that time growing up in this household. And my father would get drunk on a Friday night and a Saturday night, and he'd come home, and he'd beat on my mother. Now, I didn't know that this was going on all over Ireland. I just knew it was going on in our house. And I remember as a child, I'd be upstairs in that bed, and I'd have the pillow over my head, and I would be terrified, but I'd be praying to that God that they were teaching me, and I was afraid of him too. And I was praying to him, I'd say, please let him kill her or maybe she'll kill him, or maybe I would die. I prayed a lot to die. And I got the next morning, I had all these things going on inside of me, and what the world was guilt remorse, and I was a very, very bad child for thinking all these bad things with my parents. Now, I didn't know that until I came to AA. And I went to Catholic school, not because we're rich, simply because that's all there is in part of Ireland I came from. Now, I tell you this part of my life simply because I really believe, for me, I was getting ready for alcohol way before I picked up a drink. I really believe, for me, that if I had not found alcohol, I would have gone absolute stark raving mad. Alcohol saved my sanity until one day it turned on me and I found a fellowship called Alcoholics Anonymous. I went to Catholic school, like I said, not because we're rich. And people used to say to me, how come you didn't get an education? And I used to say, because I had frustrated Irish nuns. <laughs> but this book of Alcoholics Anonymous says, the brainstorms are not for us. And I had my first brainstorm in second grade. And I remember very well, in the, we had catechism every morning when we went into, into school. And, and every morning we had to memorize. And I couldn't memorize because we had this very small house. And, and I never slept in a bed by myself either. There was always four or five of us in the bed. And, and I, um, I used to hide under the coal hole. And that's where I used to find my, find my peace because my mother would start yelling and she'd go down the list of names and who she wanted. And if you happened to be there right in front of her, you got it, you know. I was, you know, up the side of the head. And so I was uh, always kind of trying to avoid all of that. And I couldn't memorize the catechism and I was just so full of the fear because of the anxiety and the stuff that went on. There was a lot of anxiety. The only time the Irish in my, in, in my house was when they're telling you to love you, they were usually telling you the other side of the house. And so I went into school this day, and I decided I was going to get this nun before she got me. I had made that decision. I thought, I'm so tired of getting that red, the round ruler down on my knuckles. Boy, boy, she'd just come right down on my knuckles. So she asked me the question, and I couldn't answer it. And she grabbed it. I jumped out of the seat, and I often slapped her across the face as hard as any little second grader can hit somebody across the face. And there was a black petition in this particular classroom, and Mother Superior just happened to be teaching that particular day, and she just happened to turn her head, and she just happened to look and see me do it. And she came running in, she grabbed a hold of me, she, you know, and she had the big black robes, you know, and the big cross and the rosary was down there, and, and the, the, the white thing on the head and the veil. And she's just, I mean, she's coming in, she's furious, and she grabbed me by the back of the neck, she kind of shakes me like a puppy dog. And, and I stood there and looked at, Mother Superior and 30 kids, and said, I didn't do it, you know. <laughs> you know, I was to do that until I came to the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. I would stand and look you dead in the eye and say, I didn't do it, because I could not take responsibility for my behavior. And so they took me out of there to move me to another grade, and I kneeled in front of two statues, and I assumed I was supposed to pray, and I always say three weeks, and it probably was a week, but it felt like three weeks to me. And I had to get up. I got tired of kneeling on these hardwood floors. I had great big knots on the floor. And so I went back up to apologize to the class. And I remember standing in front of that class, and I remember sister with that round pointer snicker in my back, and she wants me to say, I'm sorry. And God, I don't want to say I'm sorry. I've lowered my eyes. And, and she spoke at me with it, and I said, I'm sorry. And something else happened inside of me. And what happened inside of me was you against me. And it was always you against me from that time on. By the time I left school, I was um, just, I just barely turned 13 when I left school. And I went to work in a factory. And I had all those hopes and dreams that every other girl had. I was going to find me a nice Irish fella and get married and have kids. And I am truly, truly grateful God does not answer stupid prayers. <laughs> Truly, I found alcohol and I found boys all in the same week, and my first drink 
was a half a ball of cognac. And this guy told me that if I drank this half a ball of cognac, he would give me a pound note, which was equivalent to $3 in your money at that time. And I was, the deal was I was to drink this half a ball of cognac down, and I wasn't to stop. And I drank that half a ball of cognac down, and I didn't stop. And I went into the bathroom. I got very, very, very sick, and I threw up. And I went back out, and I said, give me my money. You know, if I know, knew what I know now, I didn't know that that night I sold my soul. I sold my soul for a drink. I didn't know that at that time. And I got my money, and I went up to the bar. If you're, if you're Irish and you're in Ireland and you know how to name your drinks, they will serve it to you. You don't have to be any age. And so I went up, and I ordered me another drink, and I continued to drink, and I can tell you what it did to me. That knot that was in the pit of my gut, it was gone. It didn't matter whether my father beat my mother. It didn't matter whether there was no food in that house. It didn't matter whether I had no education. I found the secret to living. Now, I didn't drink every day from that time on, but I drank at every opportunity from that time on. By the time I was 17 years of age, my father made the decision for me. I had absolutely nothing to do with this decision. He decided that I should come to California because the streets were paved with gold. I've been there 35 years, and I'm still looking for those bloody streets paved with gold. <laughs> I had never been anywhere in Ireland. I come, I'm not a country, I'm a culture. We call it people from the country. We're country people. We're cultures, and city people are city slickers. And I was in, came from the country, and, and uh, I had never been anywhere in Ireland. I never, the far as I ever got in Ireland was Dublin, the zoo, and all of a sudden he sent me to the other end of the earth. And, but I didn't know that this was alcoholic thinking even then. I, all I knew that it was going to be different. And if I could get away from this family, I'd never tell anybody I was Irish, and it was going to be different, you see. And that's alcoholic thinking. Even then, that's how I thought. It was always going to be different somewhere else. If I could have left me home, I would have had a good time, but always brought me with me, you know? So I, uh, my aunt took me up to Dublin and filled out all these papers. It was much easier to get into this country back in the 60s. And, and she filled out all these papers and got me ready to come to, to the United States. And my sister had come out here. And, and I um, remember going up to Dublin. I remember getting on that plane. I remember drinking champagne. And I remember the feeling. And the feeling was freedom. I wanted to be free. I wanted to be free more than anything in my life. I wanted to be free. But I was never to feel that feeling again until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous because it's the false feeling of freedom behind alcohol. And I came and I stayed with a family up in Palos Verdes, and I was very impressed with this family. They had a beautiful home, and she had a liquor cabinet. We didn't have a liquor cabinet in our house, and, and she had, they drank 108 proof vodka, and I used to drink 108 proof vodka, and I'd fill a bottle up with water. And, and she couldn't understand how come she couldn't get a buzz on. Well, she was drinking that good water that she used to buy. <laughs> and these people were very, very good to me, and, and they wanted me to go to school. And I couldn't tell her that I, when she got messages, I couldn't give her the messages. I couldn't write the names or do numbers. And, and when I drank, I was really highly allergic to alcohol. I, I mean, when I say highly allergic, I, when I'd get drunk, I used to break out all over my body with welts, and, you know, just big welts all over my body. And... and uh, and I shook a lot, and I shook a lot because of the stuff I drank, and I shook a lot because I had a lot of secrets, and, and I was terrified, and I walked around most of my life with my head hanging down, feeling so ashamed of who I was, and, and where I came from, and what was going on, and, and this woman took me down, we were down to Beach High, and she wanted me to go to school, and, and, uh, and I couldn't tell her I couldn't be with my peers, and I couldn't tell her I couldn't go into that office and fill out those papers, and, and I stand outside the door, and I, I'm kind of, I can tell you today why I was experienced. I was going into a catatonic state of fear, with ab a state of mind with absolute fear that the, someone was going to find out something about me. And I kind of slid down the door, and, and she looked at me. She said, Annie, you don't have to do this. And, and I was so relieved I didn't have to do that. And, and I started running around down the beach pier, and, and that woman tried to ha tell these people that they didn't stop serving me, that she'd have them closed up. And, and I left those people, and I was running around down the beach pier, and this was the time of when there was a lot of drugs, this was the time of the flower children, and, and it was, uh, heroin was very, was very much in, and everything was in. I, and I never got involved in drugs, and I've got nothing against those of you who did get involved in drugs. I, I just, by the grace of God, or I didn't, and I was, uh, this is a girl, her name is Fran, and she's sober many years in Alcoholics Anonymous today, and, and she was from Brooklyn, New York, and, and Franny was a school teacher, and, um, her and I ran around down the pier, and she was really, I mean, a real New Yorker. And uh, we were, I was at our house one day, and, and I was down in the back room, and this guy tied me off to shoot me up with some heroin, and, and she came down, and, you ever see someone from New York, especially from Brooklyn, go crazy? <laughs> oh, my God, she went absolutely, totally crazy, nuts. 
and she called him everything but white. And she asked her, she grabbed a hold of me, and she told me a thing or two, and she said, don't you ever do this. Don't you ever, ever do this. And took me down to the fish. She said, you and I going to, down to Paul's, and we went down to Paul's, and she explained to me you know, that if I was caught and I would be deported back to Ireland, that, you know, they would just take, run me out of this country if I was caught doing drugs. And I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified. And I knew that if I was caught and if I was deported, got right through into my head that my father would beat me a double in an airport and he'd kill me first and ask questions later. I started smoking when I was 10 years of age, and my grandmother turned me on to cigarettes. My grandmother, God love her. My grandmother was an invalid, and uh, she had a stroke, and, and um, I used to go there every day. I, I loved to go to my grandmother's, and, and I wouldn't give her the bedpan unless she gave me a cigarette. That's how I started smoking. <laughs> I was kind of not a very nice, not very nice kid, so. And it used to be all, they were called Woody Woodbines. They were the cheapest cigarettes you could buy in Ireland, and so then she finally taught me how to inhale, and, and so then she squealed on me, and I took a beating for it. I, um, my dad caught me smoking, and I'm standing there with that cigarette hanging out of my mouth, and I said, I'm not smoking. And, uh, yeah. I ate that cigarette, I literally ate it, and I was, he took a dog leash to me, and he whipped me, and he kicked me, and my mother came running into that little living room, and she said, God, Jack, you're going to kill her. He said, yeah, I'm going to kill her. She's no good, never will be any good. You know, I knew that from the time I was probably five years old. I was no good, never would be any good. And um, they couldn't let me out of the house for a couple of weeks because they were too afraid that if they'd let me out, some of them might see me, I was so badly beaten. I don't know what they would have done in Ireland. I know what to do today if you even, you know, correct your kids. I am, um, so that memory stayed with me and I knew that if I was deported that that man would meet me at Dublin Airport, he would kill me first and ask questions later. So I moved on uptown at that time of my life and you know, one of the other things I like about being sober and Alcoholics Anonymous is that I got clean clothes on today and I, my hair is combed and my eyebrows are in the right place. They're exactly where they're supposed to be. And that's not a purple eye that I got from someone hitting me. That's purple because I put purple eyeshadow on this morning, you know. And uh, when I drank, I drank everything and anything anybody ever gave me. But when I bought, I bought Ripple. I don't know if you're going to Ripple drinkers here. But I'll tell you, if you've never got drunk, it was 37 cents a bottle. came in a long neck bottle. And if you've never got drunk in Ripple, I'm telling you, you missed a trip. You definitely missed a trip. It was, you know, you never felt cheated when you drank ripple. You could, you know, get two drunks for the price of one, you know. You drink water the next day and you're drunk all over again. I used to walk along Catalina Avenue and I hated everybody. I had so much hate in me. I hated everybody. I, I hated the Americans because all you ever talked about was education. Whether you did or you didn't, that's all I heard. I didn't want anything to do with the Irish because all they did was talk about they just changed addresses to behave the same way here as they did over there. I really want you to know that I like being Irish today. I really believe that it was as far as Irish you could hold your A meetings in a phone booth. Now, I know a lot of people don't like to hear that. You don't have to be Irish in order to become a member. It just helps a lot. <laughs> My sponsor told me many years ago the reason why God created whiskey was he was afraid the Irish were going to take over the world, so he thought he'd slow them down just a little bit. <laughs> I, um, I used to walk around with a paper sack, a bottle, rubber go ahead, jeans way before they were fashionable, and I'd walk around Catalina with an old t-shirt and give all the cars a finger, and, and I don't consider myself a wino. I guess I would be a winette. <laughs> so, I took the lesser two evils. I don't know if there's any Spanish people here or Mexican people, we call them, uh, here in the group. Well, I took the lesser two evils. I start running around with Mexicans. I want you to know that I like Mexicans, and people always get a sense and they think that I'm saying something bad about Mexicans. I'm not. My best friend in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is Angie. I'm sure most some of you have heard Angie, Angie Dill. And Angie and I, many, many years ago, sat down and we kind of dissected the two nationalities and what we came up with. The only difference between the Mexicans and the Irish is that we ate potatoes and they ate beans. <laughs> <laughs> They drink hard, love hard, and beat the hell out of you on Saturday night, whether you need it or not. Yeah. And so I learned, I got involved with a group of Mexicans over there in Toronto, Lamita, and I learned to speak Spanish like as a native to the tongue, except it was all swear words. 
I uh, didn't learn anything else. I didn't have a big resume for a job. I didn't work. I uh, couldn't seem to hold a job. I couldn't seem to hold anything. And so this guy was drinking in the morning. I was just drinking in the afternoon, and he introduced me to the morning drink. It's a very, very, very exciting time in my life. I was jumping out of cars and running, just chasing. The only time you ever see a Mexican go fast is when the cops are after them. They really go fast then. I am... Um, no, Alfie always said that when you drink, don't think. And I got to thinking one day. That was one of the things that, you know, the sign that says, think, 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 in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I, and I would come up with some real winners, and I'd bounce it off my sponsor, and I'd say, well, the sign says, think, think, think. He said, not for you. <laughs> That's for other people, not for you. You do not think. Do not think. I will tell you what to think. And now I'm always said, you know, don't ever think when you're drinking. And I got to thinking one day, you know, I've been running around with this guy long enough and we ought to get married. I think it was leap year. I'm not sure it was leap year or not. But I had uh, moved all the way from the top of the hill. I'm now living over in Gardena. And I uh, took me half a gallon of Red Mountain wine, drank it, and I got out in the road. I used to do a lot of hitchhiking. I hitchhiked a ride over to Torrance Lomita and I found him. I want you to know you could smell me long before you could see me. And I proposed to him. And he looked at me and he laughed and he said, I would marry you if you handed me in a silver platter. Now, I don't know how you handle rejection, but my next thought was, I'm going to kill you, son of a bitch, because one less Mexican in this world, we'll all be better off. <laughs> I've never owned a driver's license, like I said, until I was four and a half years sober. I've got pictures of this car. If you ever want to see it, I've got proof I did do this. I got him in the car and I had the, the wine between my legs and, and we're driving the car and I thought, now is my big chance and I was on the Harbor Freeway. And I turned the wheel of the car, and I took 25 feet of guardrail, went down 30 feet in the bank window, and I thought I killed me a Mexican. Now, that's total insanity. I was able to do so many things when I was behind alcohol. It's the craziness. I never gave it one thought that I would get hurt. I just wanted to kill him. That's how much rage I had in me. I almost killed him. And what I learned out of that, folks, is if you're going to kill one Mexican, you've got to kill the whole family. <laughs> For some strange reason or another, they don't take too kindly to you messing with the people, even if they do call you any of the Irish Mexicans. I also learned that when you're running with Mexican people, you never yell cop. Ever yell cop. I yelled cop one time. We were downtown Long Beach and used to have telephone booths in California at one time. And I got out of the bar and I yelled, got in the phone booth and I'm calling the cops on him. And he kicked the door and he kicked me and I yelled uncle. Now, you see, I have no illusions. There's not something wrong with me. I don't know what normal is. I don't run around with normal people, even in Alcoholics Anonymous. Most of the people I run around with are a little off, you know. <laughs> now, the only, I don't know what, and I think my oldest daughter is probably the closest I have ever seen to normal, but I keep telling her husband, save your money because she's my daughter and she's going to need a good psychiatrist one day, you know. <laughs> the only place I ever get to see normal is on my washer and dryer. It says normal cycle, you know. <laughs> You know, I like to think that I'm delicate, you know. <laughs> so I know there's something definitely wrong. I, I have to assume there is such thing as normal, that people, when they get into these situations, they run and they leave and they get away from it. I don't. I crawl out of the phone booth. I go to the bar he's at, and I said, let's have a drink and we'll discuss this, you know. That's not real bright, you know. The guy's just half, just about almost half killed me, and I'm bent over, crawling back to the bar to have a drink to discuss our relationship, you know. I also learned in that inventory that I had some other things that went along with. I never had a relationship, whether it be with a man or a woman, you know, a friendship, girlfriend. I always got hit for some reason or another. It talks about my type of personality in step eight. It talks about the type of personality I had. I would antagonize and I would antagonize till you had nowhere else to go but to hit me. I'm not saying I deserved every slap I got. I didn't. But I, I really antagonized it. There was some stuff that went on was that if you didn't hit me, you didn't love me. I related to getting hit with love. I also had something else going on was that I wanted somebody to hit me hard enough. If you just hit me hard enough, it would kill that part of me that wanted to keep screwing up. And you know what I found here in Alcoholics Anonymous? That if you kill that part of me, that's the part you love here in Alcoholics Anonymous. You will kill all of me because that's the part you love here. 
And I have not, nobody has found it necessary. Believe me, there has been several in Alcoholics Anonymous that would have loved to have hit me. I mean, one guy came out of a meeting when I was about a year sober, and he was absolutely livid, crazy. And I had my tennis shoe off, and I'm beating him with my tennis shoe because he didn't like what I had to say at the meeting. <laughs> and those old timers are standing back there and they're saying, Don't hit her, don't hit her, that's what you want. <laughs> couldn't, understand, couldn't understand what they were saying, you know. I listened to a cricket last night talk about this. They called a special steering committee meeting when I was five years sober to have me, what was that when they impeached me out of Alcoholics Anonymous? Can you imagine impeaching me out of AA because they didn't like how I was running the meeting because I wouldn't do what those old timers wanted me to do? And, I, and there was this guy that I, we, him and I were really good buddies and I still adore him today. We're good friends today. Took it, we had to part ways. And, and I, I was starting to get help and I was starting to get well and I thought I was getting well. And so they said that, it was a time when a lot of homosexuals were starting to come into meetings in California. And I've got nothing against homosexuals. That's your preference of life, and that's fine with me, too. I don't have any, I don't have any issues with anything today. And I, um, this guy came up to me, and he said, you know, you are very hostile behind the podium of alcoholics Anonymous when you're making the announcements. I said, I am. I said, my God, this group has improved 25%. <laughs> Since I became secretary, nothing like a little ego. It's really grown. And the only reason it's grown is because of me. And uh, he looked at me and he said, well, he said, the type of people, he said, that you attract have no quality. And I went off. Crazy. I said, how dare you? How dare you? Quality, you asshole. I said, <laughs> Do you realize that when you got to the door, you came out of the state penitentiary, and I came off the streets of Long Beach, and if they were looking for quality, they would have asked us to both leave? You know, how the hell are you going to get quality, you know? And so that night, I got up at the podium to make my announcements, and I said, those of you with quality sit on this side of the room, and those of you with no quality sit on that side of the room. I never tell that story. <laughs> And very quick, those old timers call a special spirit committee meeting. <laughs> they were going to have, and I was terrified, and that was too when I learned about tradition. I was terrified I was going to get, I thought, oh my God, now I want to stay. <laughs> you know? Now I'm ready to stay, now they want to get rid of me. Nothing ever came of it. The group split and they took their coffee pot and moved to another, another area. <laughs> I guess that's how meeting starts. I don't know why I got off on, on that one, <laughs> but I had that. <laughs> but I had that thing, and I ended up in Arizona with this man. I couldn't let go. I had the obsession for alcohol and the obsession for men was unbearable. And, and I always got that wish that someone wanted to kill me. And I was in Prescott, Arizona, and it took me years to remember where I was. And, I was very drunk and I was very belligerent. I said some stuff to this guy's wife. I don't know what I said. I used to say a lot of things. People used to say that, you know, I mean, I, I did my vocabulary when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous was a lot of swear words. I couldn't put a sentence together without using a lot of swear words. And, and um, today I, I try not to swear too much. I've done a little swearing this morning. I'm sorry. Yeah, but I try not to use that four letter word. That was my favorite word. And I went out to the back seat of the car to pass out and four guys came out after me and they pulled me out of the back seat of the car and they beat the hell out of me and one guy said we'll go get the truck and we went over her and they were talking in Spanish and and uh, went and got the truck and I you know when I was new in Alcoholics Anonymous and they tell me that you won't die from lack of sleep and, and I didn't want to sleep anyway because I, I had terrible nightmares I had horrible horrible nightmares of, of, the, of how my life had gone and, and how I didn't want it to go and uh, these three, this truck comes, and this, these three guys jump off of me. I don't know where I got the sensor roll off the dirt road. But I roll off that dirt road, and my hair is full of gravel, and my dress is all torn, and I drop off the dirt road, and I walk along the road, and I'm, I'm the type of drunk. I live by four mailboxes or off market or some sign, and, and I don't know where I, where I am. I'm somewhere in Arizona. I'm never going to get back to L.A. And, and the guy comes along, and he picks me up, and we go to the liquor store, and we go to the dirty motel, and 
And that's how I learned to solve my problems. I had no idea how to solve my problems until I come to the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. When I came to the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, she talked a great deal about dying. I know what it's like to die. I know what it's like to die when you're brand new in Alcoholics Anonymous and you get to that part in the Big Book of AA and they say you have to let go of all your old ideas. And I would just come up to my throat and I'd slow hard and I'd think, oh, I can't let go of all my old ideas. I, I'll literally die if I let go of all my old ideas. I knew what was going to happen to me if I let go of all my old ideas. I didn't know what was going to happen to me if I tried some of your new ideas. I'm so grateful to the women in Alcoholics Anonymous, especially the women. And, and I really do believe there's only two kinds of alcoholics, there's male and female. The, the women are the ones that, are, that have really helped me the most and that knew how far down that snake pit I'd gone and knew that they would have to spoon feed me Alcoholics Anonymous just a little at a time. And, and that I did try on your I missed a whole lot here if I hadn't tried on your new ideas. And I know it's like to die. I end up in this little room and I, I was a little hotel with ten dollars a week and I could never come up with the ten dollars. So I always come up with the money for drink. And you had to go down the hall to take a shower and I didn't take too many showers in those days because the only time I was ever relieved of what was going on inside of me was under the influence of alcohol and I'd start drinking to get past this fear and, and to you know, to get down to do what I needed to do and I and I never got down the hall to take a shower and I lived in that room for six months and I died in an inch of time in that little room. I remember in that little room, I remember lying on the bed one night, and I, I had a hot plate, and I had a sink, and I cockroach, and I had a cockroach, and I had a and nanny in that room. And, and this particular night, I was lying in bed, and I was sucking off a vodka bottle, and I, I screamed like a banshee, and I was just screaming, I wanted somebody to understand me. There's got to be somebody in this world that understands me. I couldn't hold on to no relationship. And I remember getting out of that bed in the room, and putting on those little rubber go-aheads, and putting on that old pair of jeans, and those old t-shirts, and heading out in Western Avenue. And, and I'm here to tell you today that I always found somebody. And I always lost it for a very brief time. I always got beat up and thrown out of cars and left to my own self one more time. If you're new here today, I want you to know that I have been understood beyond understanding in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it took me a long time to understand that, too. And if you're new here today, I want you to know that I've been loved beyond anything that I ever dreamed of in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I ended up, I moved out of there, I thought, if I could just get away from this group of people again, that's thinking it's going to be different somewhere else. And if I just get away from this group of Mexican people, it's there the cause of the problem. I moved and I, I moved to Long Beach and I, I had um, walked across UCLA campus one day and told somebody I had a four-year college degree. <laughs> and all these well-meaning people were getting me all these fancy jobs and I thought, gee, I can't even write my name. Never mind, get a job in the hospital. So I ended up in Anaheim Street, and Anaheim Street and I did eight months, and I could not have done any longer than eight months in Anaheim Street. And, yes, Anaheim Street is Skid Row in, 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 uh, in Long Beach. And, and while I was down there, this skinny little pretty little guy came along, and, and he asked me out, and I asked him to get a job. And he said, no, it didn't work. And I said, I said, I can't, I, you know, you have to get a job. And I'm having a hard time supporting myself. I'm most certainly not going to support you. And uh, so he got himself a job, and, and he gave me two of the blackest eyes I've ever owned in my whole life. And I knew that we were in love. <laughs> you know, my thinking is not that great. I mean, my eyes were black all, I, my whole face was black all the way down to here. I mean, just, the, the biggest sunglasses would not cover those eyes. And we had gone together all of six weeks, and we got married, and we moved to Minnesota. And I met his mother and his father, and they were beautiful people. They were very, very good people. I really liked his family. I didn't like them then. His mother didn't drink. She didn't smoke. She didn't gossip. She went to church on Sunday. She didn't screw around, and I had absolutely nothing in common with her. <laughs> I thought, my God, I should have checked this guy out a little bit better before I married him. And I really thought that I was going to be, you know, I wanted marrying him meant that I could drink in the custom, I, in the manner I always wanted to come accustomed to. I drink every day, and he was taking bottles out of my purse, and tell me when I could drink and when I couldn't drink and he wanted me to fix some breakfast and he wanted to fix dinner and I thought, my God, I married you. Isn't that enough? <laughs> and five months into this marriage, I decided I'd made a terrible, terrible mistake and that I ought to get back to California and find that Mexican that really loves me. <laughs> <laughs> and I got another one of those brainstorms and what was it? That someone told me that if you get pregnant, you automatically grow up. What a lie, you know? What a lie. So I got pregnant, and five minutes after I'm pregnant, I don't want to be pregnant anymore. 
the doctor put me in beer and wine. I said, one glass of wine a day and one beer a day, and I found a six-pack a day. I spent that nine months by the toilet bowl, and, and um, there was five other girls in that apartment building that had babies, and each one of them came home, and they were all real happy. And, and I was the last to, in that building to go in to have a baby, and I wanted the same feelings that those moms have. And uh, I had my baby, and they put my baby in my arms, and God, I hate this part of my story, but I really love to tell you that. But I just loved her from the very moment they put her in my arms. And I got an overwhelming feeling of responsibility, and what do we do now? And I took that baby home, and God, I wanted to be a good mom. I wanted to be a good mom, and I didn't know how. And the big book says me that. It says we cannot transmit something we don't have. And I couldn't give to that child something that I didn't have. And I very quickly started to do what was done to me. And I was many, many nights my husband had to take me off of her. And I started to leave home, and I couldn't stay home. I had to get out in those streets. I had to go. Because I couldn't stand somebody loving me. Oh, what am I going to do? I am. I still have a hard time with that today when I was doing my treatments and people coming over. It was so difficult to allow you to help me. I'm sorry, I'm being a wimp. <laughs> I'm sorry. I guess it's Valentine's Day and I got no friggin' Valentine's. <laughs> I did want to be a good mom. I love that girl so much today. And that's where the women came in because they like cricket. I couldn't let you touch me. I couldn't let you hold me. I couldn't let people come up through the door. Pat Jennings, she'd come up to me. I'd back up and I'd say, please don't touch me. I was so afraid that they'd touch me and I'd keep you away from me. I kept you away from me with my mouth and my behavior. I love to be hugged today. It's been hard for me to be hugged because I've got a lot of pain on the side of my chest. And I can't hug as hard as I used to hug. But that's not always going to be that way. And I, um, that girl is 31 years old today. And she's made me a grandmother. I've got two beautiful little grandkids that they want to meet. And I have to tell you that I've got to thank the women in AA for helping me raise my kids. I just raise my kids. I am. Um, I abused that little girl up until I got long after I got sober. My husband threatened me that if he didn't, if I didn't do something, that he was going to take that baby away from me. And as bad as I was, I didn't want to take that baby away from me. He was going to go back to Minnesota, and I um, called Carol. I had been on a four-day drunk, and I had got beat up really bad because, you see, I thought that I'd be married, give me a license to say whatever I wanted to say to you. And, you know, men hit just as hard whether you're married or not. They don't care. And uh, that last four-day drunk, Billy Dean and Leona, both Billy Dean and Leona died, and they died of horrible death, close to the liver. And I uh, ended up on that Sunday morning on June 16th. My husband sat at the end of the couch with his head hanging down, wringing his hands. And my little girl sat at the other end of that couch with her little back was half off and her legs all black and blue. Her little eyes kind of sunken in her head. And I said, i got to go see. I'm going to call that girl that wants to be my friend. Because Carolyn called me and wanted to be my friend. And I didn't want to be her friend because I didn't want to have to come here. And so he said, you go ahead. You've never completed anything in your life, and you won't stay there either. And I said, I've got to go see because I can't stand what's going on inside of me. And Carolyn came and got me on that Sunday morning, and I sat in my hands, and I sat by the door. And I was just, I had been so sick the night before. I always got very, very sick. I would get so sick that the boil would come off my stomach, and then I would pull my nose and start drinking the next day in order to keep it down. And I sat by the door, and the man stood up here like I am tonight. And I know this is so true. 
And I wanted to, all I wanted for me was to please stop my head from racing and take this knot out of the pit of my gut and make these shakes go away. And I would have cheated myself. And the man said that I suffered from this triple disease. I don't know who this man was to this day, but I know what he said. He said, you suffer, Mr. Cohen, he said, you suffer from a threefold disease. It's an allergy of the body, coping an obsession of the mind, and you're spiritually sick. And he said, if I could get sober and I could stay sober the same way I drank. I'm a daily drinker and a periodic drunk. And I went out of that meeting and I'd like to tell you that I didn't want to drink. I wanted to drink more than anything in my life. I wanted to drink. I could taste it. Because you hadn't done the thing I wanted you to do. You hadn't stopped my head from racing. You hadn't taken the knot out of the pit of my gut, and you hadn't made the shakes go away. But I hear the man say, if you don't take the first drink, you won't get drunk. And I went to another meeting, and I went to a lot of meetings, and my behavior, like I said, was not that great. I was nine months sober and nine months pregnant. I gave birth to a baby boy. And I very, had that baby boy. I had two children. I have three children, all total. My youngest one I never laid a hand on. I probably should have hit her a little harder. I never laid a hand on her. And she is the one that's got the biggest mouth, so, but I love her very, very much. She's very, very much like me. She's not into alcohol yet, but she's got all the predisposition of it. It's all there. It's just waiting. And I hope she doesn't have the allergy to it. But I was, um, I ended up, I had that baby, and when I had that baby, something happened for me. It was really a very profound spiritual awakening for me at that time. And there's women in here, and you know when you go into the delivery room, and it's very, very cold in the delivery room. And I was so scared of labor, and I had one labor pain. And I said, if there is a God, show yourself now. And a blanket of warmth lay across me, just a blanket of warmth. And I started to cry, tears just kind of a little bit down my face, and I said, do you feel him? Do you feel him? He's here. Do you feel him? The nurse is looking at me like I'd really lost my mind. <laughs> and they really lost my mind. And that stayed with me because that's what I needed. But I was still afraid to really turn my will and my life off to care of him. I was still afraid to surrender to him. And something else happened inside was that what happened inside was I admitted to my animal self that I was an alcoholic. And the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says that is its first step in recovery. And it also, because now I was not fighting alcohol anymore, I had surrendered to the fact that I was an alcoholic. I wasn't obsessed with wanting to drink. And I was two and a half years sober. I was still doing a lot of stuff to my children, and I'm not proud of it. I didn't come into Alcoholics Anonymous and come out of a dark room and come into the sunlight, and everything was okay in my life. It took me a long time. My, my uh, recovery has been very, very slow, and thank God it's been slow because it needs, I needed to be slow so that I'd learn it real well. I um, had that baby boy, and I wanted to be a good mommy because now I'm sober, and you know, the illusions. But I'm like other people have to be smashed. And I wanted to be I wanted to be like those other mothers. And I very quickly was abusing that little boy. And I got pregnant again and I know what causes it. But I'm not i I'm not willing to give it up either. That's uh, <laughs> don't ever tell me if care to do that. You know. I um had three three children, I had my baby girl and and we're still trying to hang in this in this marriage. He's not going to Al Anon, he doesn't drink at this time in my life. But at two and a half years sober, and I gotta tell you this, and I gotta probably shut up. At two and a half years sober, I beat my son, and I don't tell you this because I'm proud of it. I tell you this because I really believe what these old timers tell me. And you talk a lot about God here when I was new, and you talk about the peace within, and I had no peace. I still was just crazy. I was crazier now at two and a half years sober than I was when I walked through the door. And I beat that little boy, and the man came to the door. He was 10 miles away from home. He came to my door, and he took that baby away from me. And he said, you call somebody. And I called Mary Lee, and I, I knew that I couldn't drink, and I couldn't take any pills. I couldn't take anything. I knew that I had to, something had to happen because of this outburst of rage, this little rage that just got red. I couldn't see. I, had, I would just get crazy. I went to the meeting, and I went into the meeting, and I asked him to help me. I said, please help me. Help me make the 180 degree turn. I don't want to drink and I don't want to use drugs and I don't. I wasn't. I never used drugs, but I knew that you could get some valium, some tranquilizers to help you. And someone said something, and I threw a chair down the meeting and I ran out of the meeting. And thank God I didn't drive. And a woman came out after me. Her name was Edna, and she grabbed a hold of me, and she held me in her arms, and I started to cry. 
and I couldn't stop crying. You see, I couldn't cry. I couldn't really cry way down deep in here. And then they held me, and I thought, if I cry, there's going to be nothing left. It's going to be just a big blob of jelly. And then they held me and struck me to Orange County Psycho. I didn't stay at Orange County Psycho, but that's where they took me. Because when I was new in Alcoholics Anonymous, they took me to Schizophrenic Anonymous because they didn't know what to do with me. And um, in the, the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous talk, I thought, for her, those of us who thought that we were reborn, and I was reborn that night in Edna's design. And then there was no other sober. And three months after, Edna gave me life. Edna committed suicide. And to this day, I don't know why Edna committed suicide. But she gave me life, and I mentioned Edna every podium I go to. Because Edna will always be a big part of my life, because you just don't know who's going to be there. You don't know who God's going to send to you to help you along the journey on your road. I um, ended up with a psychologist, and I'm not here for plug sex for psychologists. But I had done that fourth and fifth step, and I'd given it away, and I'd taken it all back, and I pushed it down because I couldn't forgive myself, and I prayed God an awful lot in my own life. And I ended up with this man, and he never charged me any money. I think I gave him a dollar in the last session. And I want you to know those old timers were really grateful I was going. They keep saying, you keep going, you better keep going. You keep going, you better keep going. You know, I mean, they were so down on any because they'd all spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on, on psychiatric and, and, you know, and really resented it. And, and I, um, he told me that I wanted someone to love me, and I knew there wasn't anybody in this world who could love me. I was never told. I was loved. I wasn't brought up. I was dragged up. I was one more mouth to feed in that house. And I don't blame those people. Those people never were told themselves, so how could they give me something they didn't have? I um, I knew there wasn't anybody, and they said, there, I said there's got to be somebody in here, and I said, there isn't anybody. I said, what about those people down there in AA? I said, oh, those are people who only tolerate me, because the only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking. You know? And God only knows, I want to, don't want to drink. My sponsor, who loved me so, still does, would tell me, like I said earlier, on a daily basis, you're a child of God, and God loves you, Annie, and I love you. I went home, and I called her up, and with little Alan on this to take me with the, with the three kids in the car, because I didn't drive to take me out to Orange County to this psychiatric unit. And before that, I had my son tested, because I knew he was the problem. That was the one. He, he needed them. They said, no, they wanted to see me. <laughs> and I called Lois up and I said, Lois, I said, do you love me? She said, Annie, I love you so much. And I came to believe that there was somebody that could love I, um, I couldn't love you. I didn't own it. I said, I touch my children and said, I hold my children. I love my kids so much today. Every time I see them, we hug. My kids have been absolutely absolutely wonderful to all of the stuff that I've had to walk through. They have been there for me. And the people in Alcoholics Anonymous and the women have been there for me. I was five years sober. Never ever asked me to be their sponsor. Nobody. Those old timers used to get those newcomers and move them away and say, don't talk to any, just don't, uh, just come up and <laughs> she'll be okay. Just, I mean, they do and they do it in front of me. They used to call me crazy Annie right to my face. They didn't go behind the back and say it. They said it to my face, you know? And this little gal came into the program and I, I was watching Cricket sit with her legs up underneath. Well, I had this little gal who came to the program, her name was Cindy, and Cindy had long blonde hair, beautiful blonde hair. She had the bluest eyes, blue, just crystal blue, beautiful. And she uh, she asked me to be her sponsor. Nobody ever asked me to be their sponsor. And I said I would help her as much as I could. And she wrapped her legs around her neck. She used to sit in meetings where her legs wrapped. I can't say the word, so I don't say it. She'd sit in meetings where her legs wrapped around her neck. And, and one night I went into my, down to my, my home group where we all went. And I walked in, and I was over talking to the secretary. And and this guy came up to me and he said, Annie, he said, Cindy's over there by the door. And, and she was hallucinating. She was six weeks clean and sober. And she'd used a lot of drugs and a lot of them LSD. And he said, are you a sponsor? And I said, yes. He said, you need to go over there. 
And I was so scared, you know, I was so scared I did something wrong. And I went over and I took her legs down and I put them down where they're supposed to be. And, and I took her out of the meeting room into the bathroom and I sat down on the floor because there's no, nothing there to sit on. And, and I took her in my arms. She looked at me, the bluest eyes I've ever seen in anybody, and she said, Eddie, you love me. And I felt love for the first time for another human being. And my tears ran down, it was like electricity running through my whole body. And I looked and I said, my God, Cindy, I do love you. Now I had three children, and I never got that from my children. And I really believe that it's not what God wants me to give you. It's what God wants me to give and I've learned a lot through you. I uh, ended up sending my kids to Catholic school. <laughs> and my motive behind that was to get back at all those walking nuns for all those black things that did to me. I ended up making a 12 step call on a priest, Father Joe Warren. And I ended up, him and I became very good friends, and we ended up being a very, very fine member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I ended up making amends to those nuns for what I did when I was there. I um, I divorced my husband six years ago. After 11 years of writing, my husband started drinking. That was not supposed to happen to me either because I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, don't you know? Don't you know that I work a program? Don't you know that I'm supposed to stay married forever? I'm very angry at God. Really angry. I thought it's not fair. I've done all this, all this stuff. I've done all the H&I. I've done all the 12 step work. My marriage should work. I fixed about it for years. <laughs> He just started drinking, and I tell you, I gave some of my finest talks at my kitchen. I used to have the big book on tape. I still have it on tape. I play the big book. I get in sleep, and I put it on tape, and bodies get it at night, you know, and he's just sleeping. <laughs> I, I'm really a good candidate for al -Anon. I do good al -Anon. I um, took him. I got involved in charismatic. Now, that's a Catholic thing. And I took him, I had them pray over him. And finally, about six years ago, it was in November, six years ago, I got very, very suicidal. And I knew I couldn't drink, but I thought, blow my brains out, it looked pretty good. You know, I mean, here I am, so here I am, going to all these meetings and doing all this stuff. And this, this joker, America, can't get it. Well, you know, Alcohol is much more powerful than me. And so my daughter, my oldest daughter, had to tell me, she said, Mommy, you got to go. You can't stay here. Dad's not going to change. And I want a mother. And I see you're going to end up killing yourself. And you've got to go. My other daughter told me the same thing. And I left. It wasn't easy. <coughs> it was not the easiest thing I've ever done in my life. But it's the best. Because I've given him the freedom to do what he needs to do. And I have grown up and I have done a lot of things. I learned to take care of myself, write my own checks, pay my own bills, and be self supporting through my own contributions. I am very, very, very blessed. Very, very, very blessed. Um, God has been very, very kind. When I got diagnosed with cancer, I did not blame God. I don't believe God does these things to us. I believe that he puts them in our lives, at least for my life, to see how I'm going to react with it and see what I'm going to do with it. I'd like to close. I read a lot of spiritual books, but my favorite book is Gabon. And I always close with this because it helped me so much. And those of you who have got children and are trying to raise children in Alcoholics Anonymous, my kids have all turned out real well. And this helped me a great deal with my kids when I was raising them. Gabon says to our children, come through us. They're not out. <coughs> my children came through me, but they're not out of me. My sponsor told me many years ago they're only in loan to me. 
they're only truly a gift to me, a gift from God. And I can only be there to guide them. And I can't get into their world no more than they can get into my world. And I came through the people I came through, but I'm not of those people I came through. I'm of the people of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because you are the people. You are the ones that walked the extra mile with me when nobody else would walk with me. You are the ones that held my hand when nobody else would hold my hand. You are the ones that seen an Annie that nobody else ever gets to see. And you bring her out. And she walks tall today with dignity because she is a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. How am I ever, ever going to thank you for all you've given me throughout the years I've been here with you? God bless each and every one of you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.